in the state of Florida versus Nicholas Cruz, case number 1814129. Uh, all of the parties are present, the defendant is present, and we are here just to discuss any outstanding issues uh, regard with regard to trial that's going to take place on the 18th. I will let you all know uh, initially that we have, uh, Judge Williams has graciously allowed us to use his courtroom which I went and looked at um, yesterday and it is a lot bigger. So um, we have not yet made the seating charts, but what we will do is by next week, hopefully by Wednesday of next week, we'll make new seating charts for the first group in the morning and the second group and we will give you the names. We have exactly 50 coming back in the morning, which is perfect, it wasn't planned that way, but it, it ends up being perfect and I think 59 for the afternoon. I'm assuming we might have a few people that don't pan out, um, but we'll see. And as, as those people call and let us know that they're not coming, or if they let us know, we, we will let you know. So you'll have seating charts and the jurors' names, and we'll do one through, let's just say if we have 109, let's say 100 come. I'm hoping more, but we'll do one through 50 in the morning, and then one through 50 in the afternoon. And the first group is coming at 8.30. So uh, my thought is that if everyone has a seating chart and the names a few days ahead of time, you all could make your lists, and then um, we can start as close to 8.30 as possible and then go until we finish the first group. I'm gonna ask everyone to just bring a lunch or bring snacks or whatever you need to keep you sustained throughout the day so that if we have to go straight through and just take like a 15 minute break here and there, we can do that so that if you need uh, let's say more than an hour and a half per party per session that we can still get get it done in that one day I, I won't do that any other day uh, every other day I'll, I'll try to end as close to five as possible I know that people have other things to do besides here we have families and, and children and things like that but if we can just make it through that first day so that we don't have to break up jury selection again into another day because then I think we risk going into the following week and I have not told any of the jurors that that's a possibility. That was the first thing I wanted to let you know. The second thing is that I spoke to the chief judge about the mask request by the public defenders, by the public defender's office and uh, the chief judge has indicated that based upon the COVID, current COVID numbers, he does not, I guess there's phases that he has, has to go by and he does not anticipate by the 18th that we will be at the point that we need to be as far as the COVID numbers go with having um, the option, in other words, optional masks. He thinks it will still be a mandatory mask situation. However, he is willing to approve that as you talk to each juror, if you want, we can have that juror stand up in federal court they'll actually have the juror, let's say the juror is where the second deputy is with the green mask, and they'll say, sir, come on up. And then if you see right where Ms. Schneider's standing, sort of in the middle, uh, right behind her, they have a microphone that is wireless, and they hand the juror the microphone, and that person speaks from that point. I don't know that we need to do that, but we can at least have the person stand up, and then the chief judge says he, he's not comfortable requiring anyone to take off the mask, but he will, uh, allow me to act, to give the juror the option if they're comfortable take removing the mask would they please do so um, if the person is saying let's say we get somebody who says well I'm comfortable removing the mask but not with all these people sitting here even if I'm standing in that particular situation we can take that juror separately if that's what they're comfortable with but uh, I am under the direction of the chief judge that I am not to do any type of order or any type of uh, Anything that, that, that would conflict with his order that masks are required, unless, of course, you're face-to-face. -face. I'm saying, I'm sorry, unless you're not face-to-face, -face, which is why I don't wear one unless I go sidebar or unless someone's handing me a piece of paper. Uh, the clerk doesn't have to wear one. The court reporter doesn't have to wear one because we are not within, uh, we're not even, I don't think, 10 feet within the area of anyone in our vicinity. But when we do come uh, in close contact, face-to-face -face contact, we do put one on. So with that being said, State, I'll ask you first. Do you have anything that you wanted to add to what I've said so far? Uh, no, uh, I know that the court had mentioned getting clear masks 
at some point? I, I do. Help? I did get some of those, and we are, and I'm happy to, again, I don't think I can require anyone to wear it, but I can have that as an option. Um, I should have brought them to show you all. Let me think if I, if I do have them here. I mean, I'm sure you don't have 100 of them. No, but... But I could get them, and but what they—they're not totally clear. They—they have a almost like a band around the edge, and then the middle part is clear. I ordered—I don't know—pack of ten just to see what they were like, and I'm—and I'm sure. Well, I can't say I'm sure, but I think the county or the the uh, court administration, you know, may splurge for those. But but I I, I don't know that for a fact, because they they weren't they weren't inexpensive, right. like the paper the ones. I mean, there's not, the, the, what I've said is, is, is all I can do. I, I, um, I'm not going to violate any administrative order. So I'm happy to hear your comments, your concerns, but, but really um, it's beyond, and there's nothing more that I can do than what I've already done. federal court oh, we would you were suggesting to do that. I'm no sorry. I was just giving an example that that's a common practice okay. there so I don't think asking them to stand up would be out of the ordinary because if you're called for jury duty in federal court they actually have you stand up come to the middle and hold a microphone okay. I was just saying that that's not sorry, having no that's okay I was probably unclear my my point in bringing that up is that if anyone's ever served on federal jury duty it's not it that is a, that's their practice well at least it was when I when I was on the veneer before I, uh, well, I was an attorney, I was on Jimmy Kahn's veneer, and, and you have to stand up one at a time, and you go to the middle, and you hold the microphone, and the judge asks you questions. Um, I was just thinking that would, by having them stand up, that gives them a few more feet, at least from their face being close to somebody else's face. So, okay, I'll let you. Like I said, my, even standing up, I think I have a little, I, I don't want to speak out term without having a full discussion. Um, Scheduling-wise, I will be here anytime the court uh, requires me to be okay. here. I would request, it's easier for me to go later in the afternoon and start at 9 than to be here at 8.30. Um, I, I do have over an hour drive to get here each way. Okay. Um, well, it's just going to be that one day. I won't do it any other day, but I can't risk... I don't want to put you on a time constraint that you can't abide by. I want you to be able to question all of the jurors as, as much as you need to. So the reason to start, I'm sorry? Okay, if you can just do it that one day, and I know it'll be a long day, and I know it's going to be inconvenient, but that way we can get the trial finished uh, with certainty by Friday. Uh, Questionnaire. They're going to get it immediately when they sit down. As soon as they finish, which will probably give them, I don't know, five, ten minutes, because it's not very lengthy. And by the way, you all received that from my assistant this morning. And if there's any questions that you want me to add, please let me know as soon as possible. So we'll give those questionnaires out in the morning. The jury room will have them fill it out. So let's say by uh, 8.45, we'll have the questionnaires. We'll make copies of them. We'll hand them out so that if we start... At 9 o'clock, you'll have 15 minutes to go through them. If you need a few more minutes, that's fine um, to make notes. But that's why I would appreciate it if everyone would have their, their seating charts filled out ahead of time so that when you get those questionnaires, you can, and we'll have them in order, you can just go down. And if, you, if it's your preference to make the notes right on the chart, you can do that um, so, that, so that that will save some time as well. So as far as the, and then at the trial, will we be staying with Judge Williams? Yes. Or doing there and back up 
no, 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 no. We'll go. We'll just go over. Honestly, I didn't want to um, impose upon him because you know your courtroom that you're used to practicing in has all of your. Some people have books, and you have to change out computers. And I did not want to inconvenience him for a trial that was going to be a week. But then I realized that in order to, if we did it in here, the second part of jury selection, I think my seating is less than half of what he has, the the rows. So it would take us probably two days what we'll take in there one because we have double the seating and we can sufficiently space everyone. So that's the reason and have room for all of the other stuff. So, so I went to him yesterday, asked him very nicely and he was very gracious. He has no problem with that. He's going to allow us to use it for the, the week. And then his jury room is, uh, let's just say out of order. So uh, because of a, a problem with um, the building However, the seventh floor conference room happens to be directly across from his back door. So where the jurors would come out, it, it's literally right there. So we're gonna utilize the conference room as the jury room, which seems like a good idea anyway because of the, it's, it's a big room and it has plenty of room for social distancing. And a window, which I'm sure would be nice if you're in there for a significant period of time, as opposed to mine that is a very small room with no windows. Okay, so those are the, the that's the, the tentative schedule and plan. Again, please, if you have any questions that you want added to the questionnaire, let me know as soon as possible. And other than that, um, I know that there was a motion for a special Adverse jury instruction, are you all prepared to argue that today or did you want me to, to set aside another day next week? I'm prepared. Okay. Yeah, okay. So it's the defense motion, it's D23, the motion for a special adverse inference jury instruction. I've had the opportunity to review the motion uh, as well as the case law and the specific uh, instruction that you're requesting. Um, does the defense have anything you wish to add to your written motion? Of course, that I could remove my mask standing course, here. Yeah, sure, because like I said, you're not face to face with anyone right okay. there. Am I blocking and, you? Um, Where, am I blocking no, you? No, you're okay. Whenever you're ready. Thank you, Judge. Um, as the court stated, we filed and actually filed this morning an amended motion for special. I have it. You have that as well. Yes. Okay. It's D23. Correct. Amend and it starts with amended. That's correct. Okay. The arguments are all the same. The only addition was additional case law, which I cited to. Um, as the court is aware, and I cited to in the motion, the rules of criminal procedure, specifically 3.390C and also 3.985, state that the microphone. No, I think that's <laughs> is, it, is that? Hold on. See if that's better. Okay. I, if it's better, I can hear myself repeating, but I can just step aside a little bit. If it's repeating to everybody else, I can. Hold on one second. Is it echoey? Okay. I, I can, like, well, still sounds good. I'm trying to, um, is it the folder? Was that, yeah, it still sounds I don't think, is this our equipment or is this Core TV's equipment? Is that, this is a, okay. If I stand here, does it still sound echoey? Yes. Okay. If, if I stand here, does it sound no. echoey? No. Okay, is that, okay, I can stand here. Okay. I'll just hold everything, that's fine. I have my system is off. Is that better? Is no. it no? There's a there's a feedback. Okay. I can hear it with the judge now too. You can? Yeah. I can and I didn't before. All right, let's see if we can uh, take just a two minute recess and we'll figure out whose equipment it is and if we can adjust it slightly, okay? Sure. We're in recess for two minutes. Okay, we're back in session, uh, Ms. Browdy, whenever you're ready. Okay. So, Judge, I'm just going to start off. <laughs> sure. So, we filed a motion for a special adverse inference jury instruction, and this was in, res in response, essentially, to the motion that we had last week, the motion to dismiss regarding the issue of spoliation, destruction of evidence. I cited, too, in the motion the Florida Rule of Criminal Procedure 3.90C, states that any party may file written requests that the court instruct the jury on the laws as set forth in those requests. There is no mandate that the court only 
as the court is aware, no mandate that the court must only instruct the jury based on the Florida rules of the, the Florida standard jury instructions. Specifically, Cruz versus State, 588 Southern 2nd, 983, states that a criminal case, a trial judge in a criminal case, is not required to give solely those instructions that are contained in the Florida standard jury instructions. And moreover, a party is entitled to have a jury instructed upon its theory of defense when there is evidence to support that theory. That's from Alberry versus State, 910 Southern 2nd, 930. And particularly in a criminal case, a defendant is entitled to have the jury instructed on the rules of law applicable to his theory of defense if there is any evidence to support that instruction. No matter how weak or flimsy, that comes from Gregory versus State, a fourth DCA opinion, 937 Southern 2nd, 180. All of the cases I cited to specifically Allsbury stand for the proposition that the failure to provide or to instruct a jury upon a requested jury instruction constitutes reversible error where, one, that requested instruction accurately states the law, the facts in the case support giving that instruction, and the instruction was necessary to allow the jury to properly resolve the issue in this case. What relevant information could have been yielded specifically from Arizona versus Youngblood, that's 488 U.S. 59. Whether there had been relevant information would be for a jury to make, to decide. So specifically, Judge, I filed this as I stated in response to the spoliation motion, the destruction of evidence motion, and I understand the court's ruling, but despite the court denying that motion to dismiss, the court is not prevented or precluded in any way from instructing the jury regarding the special jury instruction. And the instruction which I am requesting this court to instruct the jury, the language comes from Florida, the Florida Civil Jury Instruction 301.11a, which reads, and I've inserted my language, but this is the form of the Florida Civil Jury Instruction, which is, if you find that the Broward Sheriff's Office lost, destroyed, mutilated, altered, concealed, or otherwise caused any evidence to be unavailable while it was within its possession, custody, or control, and the evidence would have been material in deciding the issues in this case, then you may, but are not required to, infer that this evidence would have been unfavorable to the state. You may consider this, together with other evidence, in rendering a verdict in this case. No juror would be required, obviously, to infer that the, un that the evidence presented would have been unfavorable to the state, but a juror should be permitted to at least be instructed that the information that was concealed, mutilated, altered, destroyed, etc., that should they have been provided that information, it would have been beneficial potentially to the offense and to the defense and adverse to the state. And what I am requesting of this court is to instruct the jury on the instruction that I have specifically mentioned, especially because the defense has a right to have the jury instructed upon it, on its theory of defense. The case law is very clear. I cited to um, other cases in my motion. I won't go through all of those. But as the court could, can read, it is not for the court to make the determination of what evidence is or is not relevant or what is or is not material. It is for an independent juror to come to that conclusion on his or her, her own based upon the evidence that is received during trial and the evidence that is considered by that individual juror during trial. So that instruction does not mandate anything, but would allow that juror to infer based on the evidence presented that it should that whatever was destroyed should be charged to the state or looked would be adverse to the state rather. Thank you. Thank you. State. Yes, Your Honor. I'm handing the defense award versus state, which is located at 298 Southern 3rd, 638. Um, it is uh, a case from May of 2020. A copy that I'm going to come back here and just argue sure. from here if that's okay. And judge, for the record, this is the first time I'm seeing or being handed this case. Okay. Their motion, judge. I'm only obligated to give them my case law ahead of time when it's my motion. If it's their motion, you would assume that they did the research. Um, Your Honor, basically, there are a couple of things that need 
to be found by a court um, when requested to give a special jury instruction. The first thing is that the special instruction is supported by the evidence. The second is that the standard instructions do not adequately cover the theory of defense. And the third is that the special instruction is a correct statement of the law and not misleading and confusing. I would argue that in this case, all three of those um, elements are missing. Um, first of all, Your Honor, basically what the defense is arguing is lack of evidence. And there's already a jury instruction, a standard jury instruction, that talks about lack of evidence. Nothing precludes them from arguing to the jury that there is more video that should have been saved and that they can refer to the reasonable doubt instruction and the lack of evidence portion of the instructions in order to uh, base their argument. So their theory of defense is adequately already covered by the standard instructions that exist right now. Um, additionally, the standard is, uh, the uh, instruction that they're requesting includes the line and the evidence would have been material in deciding the issues in this case. This court has already held a, a, a hearing where the defense presented everything that they wanted to present and you made a finding that the evidence that they're alleging should have been uh, preserved was not material. So this instruction is not an accurate uh, statement of the law and that it actually tells the jury the evidence was material, which is a ruling that was a legal ruling that the court has already made. And this instruction would tell the jury that the, that the court basically made a ruling that's contrary to that, that you did find that it was material. So that's completely inappropriate. If you look at the Ward case, it's a very similar circumstance. In the Ward case, it was a DUI situation. But there was, um, um, excuse me, um, it, it, the Ward case, it, it talks about DUI cases. The Ward case is a, a, it involves body cam evidence. And there is a resisting an officer charge where an officer confronts a defendant, points a gun at him, and then the defendant like runs off. And the tape of the defendant running off or whatever happens afterwards was not. Um, Ms. Schneider, just slow down just a little bit. Please. Yes, ma'am. And that tape was not preserved. And there, the defense was also arguing that they were entitled to a special jury instruction because of the destruction of evidence. And the court ruled that the, first of all, the instructions that exist were sufficient, and secondly, that the unpreserved body cam evidence would not have exonerated the defendant because it would have only showed what occurred after. In this case, the inverse is true. The portions of tape that have been preserved show five full minutes before the incident. And during that five full minutes, they show that there was nothing, there was no physical interaction between the defendant and Sergeant Beltran that would have justified the defendant attacking him in self-defense. So therefore, the unpreserved portions of the evidence that happened before the incident, in this case it's after, but it's the same difference, would not be relevant to the legal defense, the legal defense of self-defense. So it is the same situation as in Ward, and in Ward, the court um, said that destruction of material exculpatory evidence by the state violates a defendant's due process rights, but in this case, there is no material exculpatory evidence. Even the defense in their prior argument could not say that the evidence was exculpatory. Um, this case cites to Brady versus Maryland, where they talk about, and, and the citation, uh, or the quote, excuse me, um, that they uh, include in here talks about the suppression by the prosecution of evidence favorable to an accused, violating due process. They then cite to State versus Sobel, a 1978 Florida Supreme Court case, and it talks about lost or unpreserved evidence is material if the omitted evidence creates a reasonable doubt that did not otherwise exist. Again, again, Your Honor, it's important to note that the legal defense here would be self-defense, and there is sufficient preserved evidence that negates that anything that had happened you know, uh, would give rise to an appropriate self-defense. Evidence of what had happened before would not be relevant to that. This case goes on on page three of the case, second um, set of paragraphs on the right hand next to last paragraph. It goes on uh, to cite Trombetta. And these are all cases that we previously cited to the court. And it talks about that the Trombetta court explained 
that whatever duty the Constitution imposes on the states to preserve evidence, that duty must be limited to evidence that might be expected to play a significant role in the suspect's defense. To meet the standard of constitutional materiality, evidence must both possess an exculpatory value that was apparent before the evidence was destroyed and be of such a nature that the defendant would be unable to obtain comparable evidence by other reasonable means. Um, exculpatory, Your Honor, again, being uh, a very big part of that argument. Uh, the Ward Court found that the uh, instruction that was being requested on destruction of evidence was inappropriate and unnecessary. We would urge the court to rule the same in this situation. We do believe that the existing uh, jury instructions amply cover this. The defense is not precluded in any way from arguing anything they want and from referring to the fact that lack of evidence uh, and the reasonable doubt instruction support whatever theory of the case it is that they want to propose to the jury. Judge, may I respond? Sure. Judge, I, uh, first, I take issue with the fact that the state is saying that the correct jury instruction would have been a self-defense instruction. We're not asking the court for a justifiable use of force instruction. I'm asking the court for an adverse inference jury instruction, which are two completely separate things. This, the state is saying, at least what I understood the state to say, is that it has to, the instruction that we're requesting has to play a significant role in the suspect's defense, as she cited to Trombetta, in Gregory versus State, which I also cited to, again, it's 937 Southern 2nd 180, it states that the trial court should not weigh the evidence for the purpose of determining whether the instruction is appropriate, whether or not the court previously found in a pretrial hearing that, in a motion to dismiss pretrial hearing, that the evidence should not be, the, the information should not be dismissed, nor should the evidence be excluded, that is entirely separate from instructing a jury as to the fact that there was evidence that was dis destroyed. And the defense is pr permitted to present its theory of defense, whatever that may be. And this instruction is, should be instructed to this jury or should be read to this jury because it supports the defense theory of defense. That the fact that a pretrial hearing where the court previously found the information not materially exculpatory, or I believe the court's language in the order was uh, something to the effect of not relevant or wholly irrelevant, that factor has nothing to do with whether or not the court should be reading this instruc instruction to the jury. I would also cite back to Albury, which was again at 910 Southern 2nd, 931, which states, the court further noted that Albury was entitled to have the jury instructed on his theory of the case, and that's whether or not the court believes that the theory is, or the state believes that the theory was not legitimate or ludicrous or was irrelevant, because relevance is not the standard, is not the legal standard for purposes of whether a jury should be instructed. So I'm asking the court to be able to instruct this jury based on the defendant's theory of defense, not a self-defense argument, but how, how can you argue that you're not going to be asking for self-defense, but that at the same time you want me to instruct the jury that the portions of this video from before, before the incident would have been material and unfavorable to the state? How, how can you make both of those arguments? How could it possibly be material and perhaps unfavorable to the state if it's not going to support a theory of self-defense? How, how else would you, would you meet that standard? because the fact that evidence was destroyed and the fact that things took place on that video prior to what we have. Had, okay, but if, if the things that took place prior to are material and unfavorable to the state, give me an example of what types of things, maybe I'm missing it, what well, types of things you could be talking about if you're not talking about self-defense? Judge, the actions or comments of Sergeant Beltran, and I will also state and how can the comments of Sergeant Beltran be both material and unfavorable to the state if they don't support a theory of self-defense? Judge, we're asking, the instruction is an adverse inference jury instruction. It is not, it is asking a jury, based on the evidence that is presented, 
or that is that comes out during trial to infer that what if they have seen evidence that there has been a destruction of some sort or a mutilation or a concealment of of evidence that they can infer if it is presented that BSO was the party which caused that concealment mutilation etc they can then infer that whatever was destroyed would have been favorable to the defense. It, it, it is, but your, your instruction says, and the evidence would have been material in deciding the issues in the case. Correct. So my question is, if the, how, would this, uh, how would this material be, how would this missing video be material in deciding the issues in this case? Because they, you're suggesting that they say that Sergeant Beltran was calling your client names or something to that effect, and how would that be material? In deciding the issues. My, my point is that it is for a juror to determine if it was material to the extent that they want to make that inference. That's what I'm saying. If, if for example, for argument's sake only, if the defense were to put on a defense and there were members of the jury who decided that whatever evidence we presented, despite not being required to, made the determination that whatever evidence we presented was enough for them to believe that evidence had been destroyed, that that evidence was material, then they can make that inference. I'm not telling the court as I sit here for the court to decide whether that evidence was material. The instruction is for a juror to listen and say, I believe that based on what I heard, that evidence is material. So much so that I am now going to infer. That is the purpose of the instruction. Not for the court to make a decision or a ruling of any sorts as to materiality. I understand the court has already made the decision as to materiality in the last hearing. That is what I am asking. If a juror makes that finding of materiality on his or her own. May I? Are you finished? Yes, Judge. Okay, sure. Um, judge, what I'm hearing here is that all of a sudden we're switching the focus of this trial from the charge defense to whether BSO destroyed some evidence. And they're talking about saying things. Let's keep it clear, there is no audio to this, in, in this video. There's no audio. So it's not like they destroyed audio that existed. There was no audio to destroy. Um, so it, it doesn't make any sense, and I, I believe that what the defense is trying to do here is kind of bait and switch and saying, no, 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 let's not focus on whether the defendant attack someone without having any imminent fear of being hurt, which would be the defense in this case, to did BSO get rid of something that we would have liked to have seen. Um, and, and, and that's not the legal standard. The legal standard is whether, first of all, the existing instructions already sufficiently address that. And again, there's already an instruction that talks about the lack of evidence. And there's an instruction that talks about how lack of evidence can lead to reasonable doubt. So they have their basis for their argument. No one is asking that they can't argue whatever it is they want to say about BSO not saving the additional you know, hour and a half, two hours of footage. They can say whatever they want about that. They're not precluded from doing that. What we are objecting to is this particular instruction, which does indicate to the jury that the evidence would have been material in deciding the issue in this case, when clearly there's absolutely no legal basis for that. And we are asking the court to focus on what is required for a special jury instruction, and they have not met any of those um, elements. And, Judge, I just have two comments to that. The first, I'll start with the first one, which is again, we are permitted to present whatever theory of defense we would like, not what the state would like to pigeonhole our defense into being. The second issue is if the court, and I, I advise the court that this was an instruction which I took from the Florida Civil Jury Instructions, I am certainly open to amending it to, if the state is having an issue with the portion that says, and the evidence would have been material in deciding the issues in this case, I am fine with deleting that portion, so long as that same instruction is read. So if the materiality issue is what the state is having a problem with, then I'm certainly open to amending it as the instructions allow. This was the defense proposed jury instruction, and I'm happy to speak with Ms. Schneider if she is, if she's objecting to it in its entirety, that's different. If she's objecting to that particular language, I can speak with her if, if she would like or if the court would like. Objecting to its entirety. Okay. The legal standard. Okay, I'm going to take the matter under advisement. I'll have an order for you at uh, the beginning of next week.
Okay. All right. Um, give me give me just one second, please, to pull it up. Okay, this is a motion in limine that you filed on 9 2021 Yes, ma'am. Okay, let's start. There's, it looks like there's four paragraphs. Let's start with the first paragraph. Um, oh, wait, I might, then we might be looking at the wrong one because the, I have an amended motion in limine and it has one, two, three, four, five, five paragraphs. Okay, let me just... Okay, I see that one. They were filed, it looks like they were uh, documented the, the uh, same day. So why don't we go paragraph by paragraph. I'm going to first ask the defense if they have any objection uh, and then if you do we'll argue. If not they'll be agreed to. Judge, I'm uh, just going to stand here so I can take my mask off. Okay. So there's so many of us at that table. Sure. Okay so paragraph A the state is asking that there shall be no reference to self-serving statements of the defendant. Is there any objection? Object. We're, we're objecting to the fact that we do not know what statement the state is referring to. I don't know to whom the statement would have been. I, I can't say in a vacuum that we know exactly what statement they're claiming is self-serving. Okay, well, any statement that is self-serving, that is made by the defendant, is excluded by the case law in the rules of evidence. So I'm going to deny, I'm going to grant the motion. Um, I'm going to grant the motion in general. I mean, it's a general rule that we all follow, so it's granted. B, there shall be no reference in this trial to any out-of-court statements made by the defendant unless offered by the party opponent or otherwise admissible pursuant to the Florida Rules of Evidence or such other authority. Is, Ms. Schneider, are these? They're duplicative. The, these two paragraphs are slightly duplicative. I just tried to get a little bit more specific on the second But is there one. something specific that you are um, concerned about? That yes. Because yes, otherwise sir. they're just rules of evidence and I'm going to assume everyone here knows the rules of evidence and we're going to follow them. Yes, Your Honor, A, B, and C are actually all intertwined. Okay. And basically there's there's a, an alleged statement that the defendant made to, I guess, one of his attorneys that is not subject to attorney-client privilege because they forwarded that statement um, to the Broward Sheriff's Office. Allegedly, the defendant at some point said he didn't like Sergeant Beltran. He didn't want Sergeant Beltran to be um, supervising him. And one of the attorneys from the defense team contacted BSO and told them that. Um, so I am objecting, and one of the other paragraphs actually talks about the attorney. This is all hearsay. Uh, it's an admissible hearsay, what a defendant says. Um, if he take, chooses to take the witness stand, then you know he can tell the jury that. But otherwise, it's an out-of-court statement uh, that's being introduced for the truth of the matter asserted. And it is only admissible if offered in evidence by a party opponent. And I can tell the court that we will not be introducing that statement into evidence. So I'm specifically talking about the allegation that the defendant said something about Sergeant Beltran to his uh, attorneys. And then his attorneys, in turn, communicated that to the sheriff's office. And that's where we go into the, um, you know, the other uh, paragraphs that, that I have here. Um, an additional statement would then be the attorneys communicating, now it's hearsay within hearsay, the, the attorney's communicating to BSO. What the attorney said to BSO is also an out-of-court statement, and, it, and as far as it contains what allegedly the defendant had told them, it's hearsay within hearsay. So we are basically moving in limine to keep out any statements regarding any complaints made by the defendant to his attorneys who were there after communicated to BSO. BSO thereafter went and spoke to the defendant and actually asked him, what's the problem with you and Beltran? And the defendant said, I don't like him. And the uh, Sharia uh, Colonel, then Colonel Sharia Green, um, asked him, well, that's not enough. Has something happened between you? And he said, I don't like him. And based on I don't like him, defendants don't generally get to choose who supervises them, and that is why the sheriff's office took no action. But all of that is hearsay. So I'm moving that all of that sequence 
can be precluded from being placed in front of the jury as it does not comply with any existing uh, rule of evidence. Is there any exclusion or, or um, exception to the hearsay rule that would, would uh, render the statement, I don't like him, admissible? Judge, before I address that, I'm objecting to the state's characterization of the conversation that was had between Mr. Cruz and other members of BSO. So I'd object to that not being exactly what was said, and that's not the, those are not, at least in total, the exact statements. That's the first thing. The second thing I would say is that I would ask the court to defer ruling because without explaining exactly at this moment, because I can't tell the court how this may or may not come out, I do not believe that all of it should just automatically not come in because there may be other ways for this evidence and this testimony to come in. So I'm asking the court, at least at this point, to defer ruling, especially where this evidence and this testimony may be admissible at a later time. I, I know that the state is saying it's hearsay or hearsay within hearsay. There, there are other ways potentially for this evidence to come in. So until those times, I'm asking the court to defer ruling, and certainly the defense would not intentionally elicit hearsay statements from any witness during trial. Your Honor, the reason that we filed the motion in limine with ample time ahead of the trial was so that the defense would have the opportunity to come up with whatever it is that they thought was an exception. Now, I would agree with them that there are times when the court can't rule in a motion in limine because it's in a vacuum and you don't know the circumstances in which something could be elicited. This is not one of those times. Hearsay is a pretty clear cut um, you, you know, it, it's a pretty clear-cut set of circumstances, and there is no legal exception that would allow this, barring opening the door. Now, if I open the door, absolutely, they could get into it. If, if you know, but that's why I included there um, a paragraph that says, before attempting to introduce any such statement, the matter shall be discussed before the court outside of the jury's presence. So, if it, I would ask you to rule that because it's pretty clear-cut that it is inadmissible. However, if at any point they feel that something in the trial has rendered that to be admissible, we can approach you know, the court sidebar and discuss it at that time, and based on the changed circumstances, you can rule. But I think it is important to do this because I don't think that they in good faith should be allowed an opening statement to talk about those statements. When they are hearsay within hearsay, clearly, they've had ample opportunity. I filed this motion you know, over a week ago to research it and come up with any kind of circumstance that they thought might render it admissible. They are not. Um, and based on that, Your Honor, we would ask you to grant our motion. And again, there's always the opportunity if something happens during the trial that changes things. I would ask you that, they, that, that you direct them that they should address that outside of the presence of the jury if they feel that that occurs. And, and Judge, if I may respond, it appears to me that the state, at least so far today, is attempting to elicit from the defense what exactly our defense is going to be, exactly what statements we intend to introduce, exactly how the cross-examination of certain witnesses is going to go, and I'm not prepared or am not going to do that right now. I'm asking the court to defer ruling at this point. I clearly understand the rules of evidence and that unless there is an exception pursuant to the rules, that hearsay cannot just come in. I am well aware of that fact. but. I do not agree with the state's assertion that there are not any exceptions or other ways that this information could come into this trial. I'm okay. asking the court to defer ruling, and certainly we will not intentionally elicit a hearsay statement, and certainly can go sidebar if there is any concern during trial by the state that such a statement is intending is going to be elicited. But at this point in time, for the court to just unilaterally rule that any communications made by our office to be a so or by Mr. Cruz to somebody else to, to just go ahead and make that to rule that way now I believe is completely at this point it's not right because we're not yet at that point in the trial but but it is clearly hearsay and I've been trying to think of a way that perhaps it, it would be an exception and I can't think of an exception and if you are either unable or unwilling to, to give me some type of reason why I should defer ruling as to one legal exception that this would apply to, then I would defer ruling. But if you are either, like I said, unwilling or unable to, to, to specifically cite an exception to this particular statement, then I'm going to grant the state's motion and I agree that you need to come sideboard before you elicit any type of, any type of statement to this effect about him 
what he said to the to the sheriff's office about not liking or not getting along or whatever whatever the exact statement was. I understand, Judge, and because of our right not to reveal every single thing we intend to cross-examine on, at this moment, I'm not going to do that. I will tell the court, again, we understand the rules of evidence and are not going to intentionally elicit hearsay statements during this trial. You're not going to elicit the statement that I've ruled is is uh, not coming in because it's in violation of the rules of evidence. And unless you can tell me otherwise, don't elicit that statement. It is hearsay and I am excluding it. Understood. Okay. Is there anything else? Uh, possible penalties, Your Honor. Um, it's my paragraph B. There should be no reference. Okay. I, I, I assume there's no objection to, to not mentioning possible penalties in this case or the other case. Correct, Judge. We just obviously we have a right during voir dire to explain the burden of proof and that if this is different a criminal case is different from sure. a civil case but sure. certainly no actual term of imprisonment or anything of that no nature. and and no no inf no no talking about as i know you all it, it, it originally asked me to mention the penalty at stake in the other case and you're not to mention that either because in this particular case the sentencing is going to be entirely up to me it's if he's found guilty it's not going to have anything to do with the jury so please don't mention anything about penalties in this case or the other case. What else, Ms. Schneider? Our last paragraph, Your Honor, then, is the issue of um, Sergeant Beltran. In, during the pendency of this case, as I'm sure everybody knows by now, Sergeant Beltran traveled to Washington State, and he was arrested for a DUI. Um, he ended, ended up entering a plea to a lesser charge on that state of uh, reckless driving. Um, he was placed on administrative, I don't think they call it administrative probation there, but it's administrative probation here. It's not reporting probation, basically. Um, so he just, you know, he had to do like the, you know, standard, it was the first DUI, so the standard alcohol class and stuff like that. And um, because he is still on this administrative probation, I agree that although normally a misdemeanor offense is not subject to impeachment, because he is still under supervision under Davis versus Alaska, I believe that the defense has a right to ask him, isn't it true that subsequent to this, you were arrested, and I, I have no objection to them saying it's a misdemeanor offense, and I have no objection to them saying, you know, and right now you are under, not, you know, uh, non-reporting probation, or, you know, some kind of supervision like that. I have no objection. I think that that's entirely appropriate. Um, and I think that they can also ask him, you know, as a result of, of you know, being a witness in this Well, that's case. the reason it's admissible, right? Correct, that's the whole reason. So those three questions, I have no objection. My concern is that it's gonna go beyond that. Um, he was questioned for hours last Friday regarding every detail of that, you know, um, particular circumstance. And those would be um, inappropriate and inadmissible, and that's why I wanted to get a, a free trial for Okay, is there any argument that the details of his arrest are admissible? The Other than the fact that he's he was arrested, he's on probation, he could conceivably be uh, currying favor with the state by going forward with this prosecution, and you, you, you're familiar with the case law. I, I understand, Judge. I believe we have a right to ask about the conditions of probation. I, I would also disagree that this was administrative probation. I have a copy of his his disposition. I don't see anywhere where it says he was placed on administrative probation. I see that he was placed and, and adjudged guilty and placed on 24 months of probation. So, I, I'm, it, it, as far as I know, at least as far as the disposition is, it's active probation. Okay, so um, you can ask him if he's on probation or if he's been placed on probation for an offense that was committed during the pendency of the case. But as far as asking him details, I don't know what details were asked, but Judge, about I, sobriety testing, you don't... Is that what you're talking? I don't yeah, know. I haven't they, read they, the depot. They asked him about sobriety testing, about what he did when he was stopped, about whether he refused to give a breath test, about whether you know he had a badge in his wallet. I mean, they asked all kinds of things that that are not admissible. Um, so I think that the fact that he was arrested, that it was a misdemeanor offense, and that he is on probation. And by the way, that disposition, as I said, it's what would be here administrative probation. It's non-reporting probation. Is what they call it up there. Something to that effect, but still the same thing. Um, I, I have no objection to that, but I think it should be limited to those three questions. And Judge, we would disagree. We believe that we're able to go into the conditions of his probation. The which, are, which are what? 
He was sentenced to 24 months of probation. Okay. He was sentenced to eight days in jail, permitted to do 64 hours of community service as a part of that probationary sentence. Has he already he, sent, served the jail time? Yeah, there was no there, jail time it suspended. It Wait. was, I just said that it was eight days of jail or permitted to do 64 hours of community service. That's at least according to the disposition from the court in Washington State. He was also ordered to pay a compliance fee. He was ordered to pay a criminal conviction fee as a part of his sentence. He was ordered to pay a traffic safety penalty as a part of his sentence. He was ordered not to drive without a license. Wait, how how does any of this go to whether or not he's currying favor with the state? Because the only reason this is in this, it's a misdemeanor conviction. It's not a crime of dishonesty or false statement. So the only reason it's admissible under the case law is to show that perhaps he's currying favor with the state. How are the specific conditions of his probation, how, how would that show that he's perhaps currying favor with the state? Well, first off, Judge, I think it's important for the court to know that he originally, and, and I understand, well, starting off with this, that he originally was arrested for a DUI where he had a 0.15 blood alcohol level. At some point, and somehow, despite that 0.15 blood alcohol level, it was dropped down to a reckless driving um, it is our position that there is circumstantial evidence as to that prefer the preferential treatment that he received, and there are certain issues as to bias under 9608 subsection 2 that would permit us to go into those areas. So if the court is concerned or if the state is concerned, again, with how those areas are gone into, I would ask the court, again, to defer ruling a lot of these issues that are being brought up before the court. We are discussing in a vacuum because I can't sit here and tell the court how he's going to testify. So so your 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 argument is that because he's a wit, because he's a listed victim on a case involving Nicholas Cruz in Florida that the authorities in another state gave him a breakdown of his sentence so that he would cooperate and testify in this case in Florida. Judge, when Sergeant Beltran came back after res and after resolving that case. He was subsequently placed back on the emergency response team, which is in charge of supervising Mr. Cruz. Again, it, there are certain issues that at this point in time, well over a week before trial, and even in excess of that before Sergeant Beltran ever even takes the stand, that the court or the state would like us to quote unquote show our hand in some of the questions that we're asking. I, know, I understand the court's concern in making sure that evidence that, it, that is inadmissible does not come into trial. I'm asking and, the but court. But you can't just say that by me asking you how you're going to get into otherwise inadmissible areas of questioning, you can't just say, well, I don't want to give away my defense. If you want to get into things that would otherwise be inadmissible, you're going to have to tell me how you're going to get into them, that they would be, in fact, admissible, where they would be admissible, or I'm just going to agree with the state. I understand, Judge, and I'm asking the court to wait until Sergeant Beltran testifies and I will tell the court that whomever, if it is myself or Mr. Ehrman, whoever cross-examines Sergeant Beltran will come sidebar just as with the other issue and discuss with the court, proffer to the court the cross-examination at that point in time, but not right now, a week and a half or 10 days or however long before he actually testifies. That's what I'm asking the court. Okay, if you believe that you can get into areas which in my experience are very clearly defined by the case law and get into the circumstances of a misdemeanor arrest, which otherwise wouldn't be inadmissible, you, please, you're gonna to need to come sidebar because for now, I, I have no choice other than to say, I'm gonna follow the, the law and I'm very well versed on the case law in this area and you can't get into all of these things. You can question him to show that he is potentially biased or that he's trying to curry favor with the state. And I haven't heard any reason uh, that you're giving me so far that would allow you to get into those things. So I am going to grant the state's motion. Again, if you feel that the door has been opened or there's some reason that I shouldn't follow the case law or that the, the case law does not apply to this specific situation, please come sidebar and I will reconsider. So I'll grant the motion without prejudice. And just for the record, all of the previous court's rulings as to the state's motion limiting are granted without prejudice. Of course, of course. I mean, it's the, what the state is bringing up is, cl is the clear law of, the, of, the, of Florida. So, so I'm not going to defer on the clear law. I, I'm going to say that it's on you all if you want me to, to make an exception to what I, what I in my experience, have, has, has been clearly defined 
uh, then you're gonna need to, to, to let me know before you do it, okay? And I, I think understand. you're agreeing to that. I, I am, Judge. We're, we're not going okay. to just cross-examine a witness. We'll proffer to the court sidebar okay. outside of the that. presence of the jury. All right, is there is there anything else for today? Okay, we're in recess, thank you.